My lips want to say good evening. My mind wants to say good morning. <laughs> but my heart is saying it's good to be here with you. I'm so glad and delighted by the opportunity to, to spend these few hours that we are going to spend together during this weekend. I want to thank uh, Elder Rice for the invitation uh, to, to be with you. And it is uh, the very first time I'm here in New Zealand. And what a beautiful uh, place this is. Looking from above, what a beautiful island. And coming from uh, Christchurch to, to this place, just to see the uh, things around, uh, you, you are blessed to have the opportunity to live in, a, in a such a beautiful place. We come from different uh, experiences, from different backgrounds. But one thing unites us, which is our love for Jesus Christ. Amen. And my sincere prayer it is that during this uh, weekend, this Sabbath day that we are sharing right now and the hours on Sunday morning, it's uh, always like this. When I come to a, a place in which we're going to share um, things related to the expansion of God's kingdom, I always pray to God, God, please, bring some discomfort to the heart of those who are going to be there. If some of you leave this place during this weekend with something in your heart that will help you to, to, to move beyond yourself, to see beyond yourself, I, I'll, I'll leave uh, this place happy because the Lord is fulfilling His purposes. We need to, to feel inside us this, this feeling, something else, something more, has to, be, has to be done. And it is my sincere prayer that the Lord will use all of us uh, according to His purposes and according to His uh, will. And before we start, I just want to pray once again, asking His guidance and His presence here with us. Father, I thank you so much for the beautiful opportunity to be here in this place, in this country, to meet new brothers and sisters. And we are here, Lord, because we love you because we want to follow your guidance and you want to live the dream that you have to each one of us. And Lord, as we listen, as we share, as we um, spend these uh, hours together, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be among us, bringing to us what is necessary to motivate us to better serve you and to leave aside ourselves and just focusing our minds and hearts in your Son, Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, bless us. And all of this we ask in the precious name of the one who came to save us and the one we love so deeply, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I just want to mention briefly with, uh, to you, under the umbrella of global mission, uh, Pastor Weiss has mentioned that uh, we do have at the General Conference six centers. Uh, the centers are established to help us as church to build bridges with some of the real challenges we face as church in the whole world. So there, we have a center which is focusing on the Hindu, uh, uh, this one here, the Buddhist challenge. Uh, the director lives in, in Bangkok, uh, Thailand. We also have the center who is focusing on the Hindu challenge. The director lives in Trinidad, Tobago. We also have uh, the director of the urban center, and right now he has moved to the US. The director of the center who is dealing with the Muslim uh, world. He lives in London, uh, Petros Badahor. And we also have the director of the center who is trying to build bridges with the Jewish uh, world and he lives in, in Paris, uh, Richard Elofer. And I'm the one who directs the Center for Secular and Postmodern Studies. Up to six months ago, I was living in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, and I received a call to move to the US, and the Center has moved now to Andrews University. So I have now the privilege of, of directing the Center from there, and also teaching at the Mission Department at our seminary. The goal is, as I have mentioned, how to build bridges with those who think differently from us. 
When you are talking about secular and postmoderns, they think it's a little bit more trickier. Why? Because they do like <coughs> us. Apparently, they are like us. But in their thinking, the way they see the world, we find the, the, the differences. I just want to share with you a little bit about the numbers. These are the challenge. In the world today, 7.34 billion people, one in three is a Christian, one in seven is a Hindu, one in four is a Muslim, one in 14 is a Buddhist, and one in seven today is not attached to any religion. One in seven, the world today, they say, they are not affiliated to any, any church. It's a new, the new trend we see today. They call themselves the non-religious people. And of course, you have heard about uh, the 1040 window. And here I just presented to you the post-Christian window, mainly talking about Europe, the US, and of course, this part of the world, Australia, New Zealand, in which the numbers are not the same. When you look at the main challenges that we face in this postmodern, post-Christian world, and actually the numbers I have from Australia, I think is almost one for every four. Uh, I'm not so sure about New Zealand, but it could be pretty much the same or even more of people who are not connected to any church. They simply want to put aside their experience. So 1.1 billion people today, they identify themselves as non-religious. It's not so simple to get closer to them, not so simple to share the good news because they simply don't care anymore. They are tired of church things. And I just want to unpack this a little bit more tonight and during the moments we are going to spend uh, tomorrow together. One third of Americans have not attended church in the last year. And a country that uh, pretty much has been built upon religious uh, concepts and principles no longer is living this reality. Only 2% of the Swedish population attend church on a regular basis. So those are some of the numbers. I want to mention to you something important tonight. Every single organization, uh, not only talk about religious ones, and this is the logo of our church, they today pay close attention to, to their image. That's why the logo has an important aspect in the whole thing. Because through the logo, uh, you can share some of our uh, principles, some of the things that are behind of who we are. And this is not only with us, but any company, in their logo, they have a concern. They have an image, an idea in which they wanna, they wanna share. I just wanna uh, show to you uh, a couple of logos and to explain how important it is to have the right image when you talk about this. Do you remember this one? This was the Olympic, uh, the logo for the Olympic, Summer Olympic Games in London, the last one. In a few months, the next uh, Summer Olympic Games will be in my country, in my home country, Brazil. And actually they paid $400,000 for that, that logo. Up to now I have not figured out what it is. I just see the, the flag in there, the British flag. And this is another example. <coughs> this is the logo of the petroleum company, British Petroleum, and they paid $4.6 million for that thing. I would do a flower for cheaper for them. <laughs> yeah, you see, but it's a whole marketing plan which was behind. There are some logos which are more uh, known and famous than others. Just to have an idea here with you, I'm going to show some and you tell me what it is. What is this? Yeah. Everyone, even here in New, Ze in New Zealand, everyone, the whole world, when they see, they say Nike. What is, what, what's the meaning? What is behind? What do they have in mind with their logo? The Nike logo has even a, a name. It's called Swish. It comes from Greek mythology. They had a, a goddess in which she has a, a little wings in, in, in her legs. And, but be, when you see the Nike logo, what comes to your mind? Sneakers. What? Sneakers. Sneakers? 
Just do it. <laughs> just do it. Yeah, just do it. That's that's the the catchy phrase. What else? You are always correct. You just check. <laughs> correct. You move faster. You move faster. Good. Good. What else? What is behind it? They want to portray the idea that when you buy their product, you will reach success in what you do. So just do it. Buy it. You're going to win. That's the concept they have behind. What about this one? What is it? Everybody knows it. When you see Apple's logo, what comes to your mind? Guardian of Eden. <laughs> Guardian of Eden. What comes to your mind? Apple, of course. iPhone? Technology? Quality, thank you, quality. And one thing that uh, usually they do, Apple, before they, they, they really put up their products for sale, they want to do a, a, a release of the ideas. They come, I mean, they, they call the, the press and they show the new things. Uh, and pretty much what they want to do is just to, to show how important for them is innovation. They want to be ahead of, of, of the competition. So always trying to innovate. Always trying to, 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 to win all the competition in the products they, they prepare. What about this one? McDonald's. McDonald's. Even here we have McDonald's, no? Coming from, from uh, Christchurch, I, I saw a few, a few advertisements on the road. McDonald's, 15 kilometers. I even told the person who was bringing me up, you guys have McDonald's here too, no? Everywhere, everywhere. How, how do they call the meal they prepare for the kids? Happy meal. Happy meal. Happy Meal, all over the world. Happy Meal. What do, I, what, what do you think they are trying to, to share to, to especially children when they get their products? You see, eating this stuff, you're going to be happy. 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 Happiness. You see, each company is trying to somehow share what they carry as a principle to them. What about this one? Mercedes. Mercedes. Do you know what's the meaning of the logo? Mercedes logo? They want to reach power on earth, the sea, and the sky. Those are the three dimensions of the engines they produce. Power. Power. Every company, when develop their logo, they want to portray something. My friends, you know what's the value of a logo? I have here the, the most valuable brands, and which was released last year. And you see here the Apple is today considered the most valuable brand. You see the amount $246 billion. Google, Microsoft, IBM, Visa. So you have the list in there. The value of a logo. The value of a, uh, an image. But when you look, look at the list, and we just, I just shared with you some of the most famous logos in the whole, whole world, uh, none of them is really the most known. There is one logo that has been around longer than each one of those. A logo that really conveys a principle, an image, which is much more powerful than all of them together. Yeah, you got it right. The cross. That's the logo. What do you see when you look at the cross? Friends, if it were not for a man, God, a God man, who gave his life on a cross, today the cross would be only, only a piece of a museum. Probably something that the father would come with his son would say, look, look son, this is the way the, Rom the Romans used to kill people in the past. 
the cross would be only a museum piece, nothing else. But because a man God, God man came to this planet to give his life to save us, today the cross has a different meaning. It's, it's interesting because when you look uh, to the history, uh, the cross actually, the death on a cross was not invented by the Romans. The Persians invented it. The Romans, they kind of upgraded the whole system. The cross at that time had meanings. Humility. Pain. Shame. But after Christ's death, the first followers, the first Christians, it's incredible, but they decided to take up that logo to their movement because the meaning has now changed. Hope. Grace. Peace. You know what's the problem? The problem today is when we compare, and I showed you the numbers in this planet today. Many people, when they look at a cross, it doesn't carry any meaning to their lives. Some of them, they, they have crosses in their homes, on the wall. Some of them carry a cross in the neck, but they do not know the real meaning of it. And we have the privilege to follow the CEO of this company. We have the privilege of understanding the meaning of the cross. And my sincere desire to all of us is to walk wherever God takes us with the purpose of really sharing with everyone around us the real meaning of the cross. I want to... Uh, just invite you to look at the cities of your country. When you look at people around you, how can we, in fact, be meaningful for the, to them? You know what? One of the greatest challenges we face as church is to leave the illusion that we can really be real Christians, the illusion that we can really be a real Seventh-day Adventist two or three hours per week in one day within four walls. If we don't learn how to share our experience with God in our everyday lives with everyone around us, we are missing the mark. And I'm delighted just to hear here, I know I have a good friend here in this part of the world, which is Wayne Krause, and we have shared some, some thoughts together. And he keeps telling me, there, in my part of my little corner of the world, people are kind of getting what it is, in fact, discipleship. Mm -hmm. And I praise God for this. Because a real life of a disciple is not only a few hours per week, but every time, every day, in every single opportunity, take advantage to share who you are. Not only what you believe, not only what you heard, but who you are with everyone. And as we see this word here, it's a big word, postmodernism. And of course, those who are into this subject uh, know better than me that this word has not been used much uh, lately in the literature. Uh, today you can read about post-postmodernism. Some are talking about post-post-postmodernism. And actually I don't care much how you call it, but the effects of, of something that's going around us will stay. And we do not live in the same context that you used to live 30, 40, 50 years ago. 
In these few minutes that we are going to spend together here, I just want to uh, share with, with, with you some of the main impacts of this, we can call it paradigm shift in the Western world. But before, I just want to invite you to a very known story in the Bible. The text is in the book of Acts, chapter 17, if you want to follow. I just want to share with you the experience that Paul brings to us, Acts, chapter 17. Let me just see here in the first verse. From verse 16, Acts 17, 16 on. It says that while Paul was waiting for them, he was waiting for his friends to, to, to meet with him in Athens. The Bible text said that he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And actually the original word in Greek, I mean, he was really upset. Because he saw the, the circumstances of, of that, that place, that huge city, a very important city in that time. So uh, he had in his heart this, this cannot continue that way. And sometimes I ask myself, and I want to ask you tonight, when was the last time that when you saw the cities around you that you had the same feeling? The thing is, we get used with the routine of our lives and we kind of, we do not pay attention to what's going on. That's one of the problems. But Paul, he, he, he could not simply allow things continue to go the, the way they had always been uh, because he had a, a purpose in his heart. And I love this when the Bible says that he was reasoning, he was talking, uh, and he had a two way of approaching people. First of all, because he was a Jew, he used to go to the synagogue, and there he could find the Jews and God-fearing Greeks. But as well, the second place, in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. So intentionally, Paul was sharing his experience in the marketplace. So he was intentionally meeting with people in order to share with them uh, his experience with God. And because he was sharing with them, we see here that uh, some of the philosophers, they came to him and they said, may we know what this uh, new teaching is that you are presenting. And at the end, we see that he just confirmed he would, we would like to know what they meant. Even though today we see this number, I mean, 1.1 billion people in this planet who say they are tired of religion, some of them have the same feeling. Would you like to know a little more? There are levels of secularism. And that's one of the things that we need to understand. Let me ask you, do you think there are secular people in the church? Oh, that was a strong yes. Hmm? <laughs> Secularism is something, I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, tomorrow about this too. It is something that has uh, somehow affected everywhere, everyone. There are levels of secularism. Some of them are really hardcore seculars. They can even be hostile uh, in some circumstances. Others, they are seculars in the way they, they live. Some people, they say they believe in God, but they live as if God didn't exist. Because the priorities of their lives are kind of different of what God really wants from them. So we need to understand then the way Paul was just presenting in the Areopagus to those people, it's interesting the way he, in his speech, people of eth Athens, he says, I see that in every way you were very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an author with this inscription to an unknown 
God. I just love this Bible verse because Paul, as he was looking around, he saw the opportunity. Because of his intentionality, he found the opportunity to build the bridge with those who were around him. And dear friends, brothers and sisters, the day you and I decide to live intentionally as Paul did, and it is possible, you notice that many opportunities will come to us every single day. Opportunities to us also to build the bridge to the hearts of people and to really share God's love with all of them. The same unknown God in the times of Paul, in the old Athens, we see today. Many people, they simply don't know who God is. The same context, the same difficulties in the past we see today, but listen to this. This is what Mrs. White has written in Gospel Workers, page 300. Paul, he varied his manner of labor, always shaping his message to the circumstances under which he was placed. Those involved in God's mission should nevertheless study carefully the best methods in order that they may not arouse prejudice or stir up combativeness in their hearers. So we need to follow the same example, always shaping his message to the circumstances in which he was placed. We need to explore new methods. We need to explore new ways of communicating with people. Because when you talk about evangelism, evangelism, it is nothing more than a, a, a communication process of sharing one message, the gospel message with everyone. But we need to find a way, the proper way, so people can really understand. Because today when you talk about the truth, what's the meaning of that word to, to many people? I remember when I was a, a little, little, little boy, my mother, she accepted Christ in her life and she decided to become a Seventh-day Adventist. I was one year old. So my whole life was in the church. And I remember when I was small, when she was talking about the truth. I have accepted the truth. Today, when you talk about this word, I mean, it has several meanings, several meanings. Today, when you come to a, a secular, to a, somebody who is guided by this post-Christian, post-modern type of thinking, it is unacceptable to say that you have the truth and they don't. Which one are you talking about? Your truth or my truth? God? Bible? Church? Come on! Don't try to impose on me your feelings. Don't try to impose on me your beliefs. And because of this new reality, today people simply, they don't share. They'd rather be quiet on their little corner and don't expose themselves to this new reality. Is this something that we are really willing to share or not? Look at this. Uh, this is a an article that was published a couple of years ago in the New York Times, the title, One Nation Under Gods. Is it true? I, most, I showed to you that uh, one third of Americans, don't, they don't go to church anymore. Uh, the challenge is this, religion, please, no, I'm tired of it. So in the surveys around the world, especially in the Western world, that's the answer they give. No, which religious do you, uh, organization do you believe or do you belong to? No religion, no religion. Look at the numbers. The ch changing U.S. religious landscape. The only one that's growing is the unreligious, the non-religious. You see here evangelicals going down, Catholics going down, mainline Protestants going down. But in the past few years, we see the growth from 16 to 20, uh, almost 23%. We are talking about 56 million Americans, which I mean, who today say, no religion, please forget about this. This is not only in there. You see here in Australia, 
the number of no religion is 24.8 percent. Uh, Japan, when you ask, is religion important to you? Only 2.8 percent say it's important. 50 percent they say, not important in my life. That's the new world in which we are living in. Iceland, religious believers, they fell from 87 percent to 46 percent. Non-believers grow from 13 to 54 percent and from 96 to 2015. That's the new trend. That's the new world in which we live. This is Europe. You see here, the blue part, it's hard to read, but the blue part are the percentage of those who say they believe in God by country. So the most secularized is Estonia, Czech Republic, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, France. The red part is those who believe they, they say they believe in something, in a force or whatever. And the green part is those who say we do not believe on anything. That's the challenge we face. Actually, we can work in this red area here because they say they believe in something. Not necessarily in God, but they are at least willing to talk about this. And this is South America, where I come from. It's unbelievable. Uh, Brazil is the largest Catholic uh, country in the whole world. Brazil has the largest uh, membership of our church, some of the Adventists. But the part of the society which grows the most today is the non-religious. Also, people who are simply tired of religion. You see here the, the growth. No religion growing from 5.1 to 6.7 percent. So we live in this new world. That's a new reality. Whether you like or not, that's reality around us. This paradigm shift, this social cultural uh, transformation from a modern to a postmodern, whatever you call it, a condition. The thing is, the church, when you talk about the church, is our church focusing its eyes in the past, present, or future? What do you think? I remember the very first church I used to pastor 25 years ago. My very first uh, uh, board meeting with the church, I was presenting a new idea, a new project to the church. And the first elder stood up and said, Pastor, why to change? Why to change? It's incredible. Some people, they really are afraid of change. And when we talk about changes, we are not talking about principles. We are talking about methods. We need to change our methods. Why? Because people change. Amen. People don't think the same way. I'm just showing you the numbers. 20, 30 years ago, we used to live in a different world. That world doesn't exist anymore. We need to find ways to reach the hearts of people. How many minutes I have? I forgot to... Actually, my, my clock, it's 4.10 4, a.m. <laughs> the problem is, I'm not sure if it's yesterday or, or tomorrow. That's the thing. Which is <laughs> even worse. But I think I, I have 15 more minutes. 15. 15, good. Let me try here really quickly in this last part here. Just to talk about important definitions. Today I'm just giving you a, 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 a broad uh, introduction to what I will be sharing with you in different aspects. Secularism, I have mentioned to you what it is. It's rejection to everything that is connected with religion. Those who say, no, please. Forget about this. Another thing that we need to understand is when you talk about pluralism. That's a, a, a new challenge that we face, especially in, in, in urban centers. I remember a few, a few years ago, I was visiting a family in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a large city, almost 20 million people. Uh, it, it's crazy. It's crazy down there, yeah. Uh, I went to the, to the home of a lady. She was kind of interested in the Bible. And then I came in, her husband was there with her, and then she told me, Pastor, please uh, come in. I was walking in the corridor that uh, was ending in the living room, and I saw a 
table in the corridor. In some uh, Catholic countries, people, they like to, to leave a, a Bible open in a little table. It's kind of, a, of an amulet to, to protect them, you see? Uh, they don't read it. It's there, usually on Psalm 91. Oh, yellowish, full of dust, but it was there. When I saw the Bible open, I so said, oh, that's good. At least uh, they show interest in, in, in Christianity. The problem is the Bible was here. By the Bible, on the right side, there was a statue of Buddha. <laughs> Same table, Bible, Buddha. And on the left side, a pyramid. So Christianity, Buddhism, New Age, all together. So the thing is, you shoot everywhere in the hope they are going to hit someone. That's the idea. This is pluralism. And the more we live in urban centers, urban areas, this is a, a more real. Because people are trying to experience whatever comes to them in order to fulfill their, their needs. And the third one, um, important word is postmodernism. It's hard to, to understand what it is postmodernism if you don't understand what is the modern worldview. Because postmodern means after the modern, you see? I just want to mention, real, because of our time here, we don't have many, much time, uh, some of the main movements that gave the birth to this uh, worldview, the modern worldview. We see the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation, the Enlightenment. Uh, during, and it's hard because those movements, they overlap uh, in time. The thing is, the cosmology at that per period was especially before the Renaissance, was pretty much this. God was on top. Below God was the church. Below the church, the nobles, the king. And below the monarchy, everyone else, you and me. Because of those movements, that cosmology somehow was kind of changing with time. And men was at the bottom, little by little, was going up, up, and, and took the place of God. So the challenge, especially during the Enlightenment, in which uh, the main idea was going around reason, going around uh, science. So whatever you can explain, I will accept. If cannot be improved, psh, forget about this. So men started to challenge the existence, the existence of God, challenge uh, as main aspects of, of religious life. Some of the main concepts are these, uh, we don't have time, some of them are kind of complicated, but uh, it's important just to mention this objective rationalism. So everything that is understandable in rational ways, I'm going to accept and live in my life. This is the period in, in which science, science and technology uh, is started to, 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 to be more and more accepted. The language was mathematics. And one of the things, I just want to mention this last point here, this optimistic progressivism. In the more modern worldview, one of the main uh, uh, phrases is this, uh, progress is inevitable. It will happen. Uh, when I was studying this many years ago, writing my dissertation, I remember when I was reading about this uh, uh, way of looking at progress as a good thing, there I remember what it is in the middle of the Brazilian flag. I don't know if you have paid attention, probably not. But we only have two words in our flag. Order and progress. A pretty much idea coming from enlightenment. The thing is this. We have problems. It is our responsibility to find the solutions. How? Through science, through technology, we are going to change the world. The world. And we will live in a better place. That's the idea behind the modern worldview, the modern movement. We will change our lives to the best possible way through science and technology. <coughs> Is it happening today? Do we live in a better world? So because of this, some of those aspects that I have mentioned too became uh, 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 kind of, they started to be challenged by this defiance to the supremacy of reason. 
How do we explain, for instance, intuition? How do we explain feelings? How do we explain emotions? This opposition uh, to science. Science is good. It helps us a lot. We cannot live without our cell phone for many, many days. If you try to see it, you can be, uh, well, anyway. Uh, but it does not bring uh, the solution to each one of our problems. There are deeper things that uh, reason cannot explain. And some of them are related to this challenge that the postmodern worldview uh, brought to us. I just want to mention a few concepts which are behind this. One of the words is this relativism. I'm going to just give you a simple example how it came about. A French philosopher called Jacques Derrida, from the field of literature, it's amazing the influence of, that he had, he came up with a theory called logocentrism, the theory of the meaning of the words. And how do you call this? Come on, how do you call this? Chair. chair. It's a chair. Who gave the name chair to this thing here? You know? Interesting, no? Chair. So who told you this is a chair? Probably your mother or your father. We don't think how we learn the words. We simply learn because somebody tells this is a chair. If you... Uh, my youngest daughter, now she's nine, when Gabby, her name is Gabriella, when Gabby was a little uh, toddler, when she was starting to speak, if I would come to Gabby and would say to her, my, my darling, this is a duck. If nobody would challenge her, you know how she would call this? A duck. And if nobody challenged her, in the future, you know how she would teach uh, her uh, children? The name of this? A duck. <laughs> when we stop about the meaning of the words, hmm, so Derrida, he came up with another theory called the construction. The thing is, it's a long conversation, but pretty much is this. When you read any text, it doesn't matter what the author had in mind when he wrote. What really matters is what you get out of it, is your own interpretation. So it's a long story, we don't have time, but from this kind of thought came this relativistic way of looking at life. And from literature it went to other disciplines until theology. So today, relativism comes out of this whole process that Derrida started. Pluralism, rejections of, rejection of meta-narratives. Another important philosopher, um, Lyotard, Jean-François Lyotard, he wrote a book in which he defines postmodernism as rejection of meta-narratives. What is a meta-narrative? A meta-narrative is any story that tries to explain human life to all of us all the time in universal ways. Uh, what is the meta-narrative of us Seventh-day Adventists? How do we explain life? We have a story, how do you call it? Creation. The great controversy between good and evil. That's the Seventh-day Adventist meta-narrative. In the mind of postmoderns, they reject any meta-narrative. You cannot believe on those. So that's a huge problem when we are talking about, this is a, another problem we face is historical discontinuism. Uh, who writes history? Winners or losers? Winners. Well, losers, they, they are dead. Dead people don't write anything. <laughs> so if the, who can guarantee to us that what we read in historical books is the truth? So it's kind of weird, this thought, but they started to kind of uh, not having this confidence in the past. Postmoderns, when they look at the future, I mentioned to you that this uh, defiance to science comes because science, it's good, but at the same time can be very, very, very dangerous. We can destroy ourselves using weapons in which we didn't have in the past. So who can guarantee to us that we are going to have a future? 
So if they cannot trust in the past, if they are very pessimistic towards the future, what is the only dimension that really matters? Now, now that's why you do it now. You live your life. I want to live the way I want right now. And this is not of your business. Mm -hmm. That's the mentality. I want to live now. If I'm happy, pff, I want to do it now. Another huge concept in this process is the meaning of community. How crucial for these newer generations is community. And, and my friends, just listen to this. Every given time, there are four generations sharing the same space, breathing the same air. Two of those generations are and work kind of raised by the modern worldview and two generations by this post-Christian, post-modern way of looking at life. And then we wonder, why is it so, so difficult to, 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 to make people live together, united in the church? They think differently. They see reality in different ways. And just to finalize here, this re-evaluation of human life, uh, another important uh, gentleman, his name Foucault, Michel Foucault, a bright guy, bright mind. Uh, I forgot to mention the, in the modern period, uh, a very famous guy was Francis Bacon. And he used to say, knowledge is power. The more you know, the more you can control people. Foucault, this postmodern philosopher, he says, knowledge is power, yes, for destruction. The more you control, the more violent we become, and we are going to destruct ourselves. You see the difference? So those, and Foucault uh, was gay, uh, very gay. Uh, he died of, of AIDS. But with his way of looking at, uh, at, at things, he had a huge influence in, in his students. And one thing I can tell you for sure, everyone that goes through university, to a college degree, when you ask them, what is truth, relative or absolute, they will tell you it's relative. It's in the academic process that people become more and more uh, open to these ideas. And the results are these that we see around us. I'm just going to jump this here. Those are some of the main characteristics of this. So just for you to have an idea, a visual idea, how things are changed. In the pre-modern times, I didn't even mention, life was a dot. God put in there, I believe, and that's it. When you look at the modern worldview, the thing is like a line, always going up, but as a line. In the modern worldview, how can you go from point A to point B? What's the best way? A line, straight, that's it. In the postmodern mind, what's the best way to go from point A to point B? Is the way you wake up, the way you feel. Doesn't matter how, and it's not your business. Huh? I do the way I want. So you, you need to learn how to respect my feelings. And if today I want to go there rolling, I'll go rolling, I'll go dancing, doesn't matter. So that's the new thing that we are living today. To finalize, people don't read. Only those who are really in the field of, of literature or in philosophy. People don't read Derrida, Lyotta, Foucault. How people become postmodern? Usually through popular culture. Popular culture. Just going to give you a few examples here. Art. Art. What do you see there? What do you see in this, in this frame? Come on, guys. We have five minutes. What do you see? An apple. What else? A face. Industrial. A sky. It's not working anymore. What else? Did you see the name of, the, of this art here? Garden of, of Eden. Yeah, a face in there. You know what? Everything's on purpose. They do stuff in such a way that it requires interpretation. And whatever you say, it is. It's OK. It's okay. Whatever you see, it is. Look at this one. Same thing. What is this? I have no idea. But if I say it's a banana, it is. And psh, you, should, you need to appreciate uh, my, <laughs> my feeling here, you see? 
architecture. That's a no yeah, yeah. Look at this. This is not Photoshop. This is the real building. The thing is, to, you mix materials, and you mix. Uh, let me say it in a different way. What is uh, every building? When you look at it, if the shape of the building is symmetric, you know it's symmetric. No, the, you cut in half. The right side is exactly like the left. Uh, it comes from a modern architecture. Postmodern architecture intentionally they break the symmetry. Why? Because the goal, listen to this, this is the most important part of what I mentioned to you. The goal is just one, to break the linear way of thinking. Because the modern worldview brings a linear way of looking at life. So postmodernism breaks it. So you, you have to think different ways. Look at those. This is a museum in Canada. Uh, if you go and look at, I mean, the pictures are beautiful inside. But you see, they do on purpose. They mix the old with the new, the brick with the aluminum, uh, with, with, the, with the, the glass. Uh, so this is postmodernism. Uh, this is in LA. And where is this? Come on, right here, close to you. Yeah, Christchurch, you see? This is postmodern architecture. You see, I did my homework. So this is a beautiful building. It's the art gallery, no? In, in, in Christchurch. And this is postmodern architecture, you see? Breaking the linear way of, of, of thinking. Of course, the same thing you see in music when they mix styles, especially in fiction. From there goes to TV, goes to, 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 to the theater, to the movie. I'm um, just going to give you a few examples. The Matrix. When you watch that crazy stuff, you see the blue and the red pill. It's all about choice and the breakup of dimensions. And probably one of the best uh, examples is, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, A Beautiful Mind. It's a true story of a man named uh, Nash, John Nash. And actually, he died a couple of years ago. And he had uh, schizophrenia. When you watch the movie, you get upset and mad because they are playing with you. You're watching, then suddenly you say, ah, I got it. What I'm watching right now is not reality, it's his mind. And you are happy for five minutes because then you figure out that what you're watching is not his mind, it's reality. And they keep playing with you throughout the movie, breaking the linear way of thinking. That's the idea. So when you have this line broken, what happens with religion? What is the way of salvation? Is there a way? It's a mix. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Who can say that your Jesus is better than my Muhammad? Or that following Hindu gods, it's, it's worse than following uh, Christian principles. So today is a mixed, and people are kind of open to this reality, but not following what God really wants from their lives. That's the result. So you see religion, spirituality, it's, it's a mix. Question. And let me just jump this tomorrow, I'll come back to this. When you see this new reality, let me just go to the next here. Come on, here. We see this uh, new context. And actually, something that sometimes we are trying to do is to answer the wrong question. The question 30 years ago was Is there God? And some of us as Christians, we are still trying to answer the same question. People no longer are asking that question. The question today, the 21st century, is which God? Which God? Most of people who say today, I'm not religious, they have in mind, I'm not connected to church. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of church. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of the violence of the feelings I have when I think about church. 
but they are spiritual. They want to develop their spirituality out of the church. So the question for us to finish tonight, is this new reality a threat or an opportunity? opportunity. What do you think? I believe this, even though this way of looking at life is very, very dangerous. Can be a huge, and it is a huge threat. When you talk about relativism, ooh, that's tremendous. That's tremendous. But it brings to us an opportunity that we did not have in the past. Just to finalize, I was uh, making a presentation to a group of pastors a few years ago in another part of the world. And in the middle of the presentation, a pastor raised his hand and then he told me, you know what? Now I understand what's going on in the life of a friend of mine. And then he told us this story. He said that the son of this friend was doing drugs. And he was a Seventh-day Adventist. The father was in despair, did not know what to do. And he kind of thought about asking the son to leave his home because of the problems he was bringing. The son came to him and said, Daddy, let me stay. And then he said this, the same way you love Jesus, the same way you love the Bible, I love marijuana. Let me stay. New way of looking at life. We need to be sensitive to this reality. Not allowing this relativistic way of looking at life uh, really take our young people, the newer generations, and taking opportunity, I mean making the best of every single opportunity to build a bridge, uh, using opportunities that this openness to spirituality also bring, brings uh, in this, this new context. Tomorrow I will continue uh, with you talking about some of the principles. How can we really use this as an opportunity? In my sincere prayer that we are going to really look uh, through those principles on how we can really be meaningful as Christians, how we can really share the logo of our lives. How can we really share the love we have to Christ with those around us? May the Lord bless you and help, uh, may the Lord help us to see things in different ways in order to fulfill His mission to those around us. Thank you.